Amen. Thank you, Brandon. Good morning, church. My name is uh, Grant Glover, and I am the college pastor here at PCBC. We've been going through our sermon series called Real Life, where we've been going through the Psalms, these ancient hymns and poems written thousands of years ago in the Old Testament, to see what kind of relevance they have to our lives in modern society on a day-to-day basis. And I would like to bring attention to you this morning something you may not be aware about, a global crisis of epic proportions that is sweeping the globe, and it is this. Millennials having to live in a financially responsible way. It's a real tragedy. And I read probably the most heartbreaking story of it all from a girl by the name of Mary Madigan, who wrote about her trauma and having to navigate the waters of adulthood responsibly in News.com Australia. Yes, I did find this article. And this is what she says. Inflation is rising. And now I live more like a boomer than a millennial. It hurts. Yes, living costs have become so bad that my lifestyle is more like, I, more like a semi-retired mom than a hot young person. <laughs> Terrible. Everything is expensive. Gas, groceries, rent. Forget the dream of buying a home being dead. My goal of having a Gucci belt is in the morgue. <laughs> Are you depressed yet? In 2023, being a millennial means Ubers. Uber Eats, brunches, dinners. My boomer parents have constantly rolled their eyes at these antics, and I roll mine right back and explain that I'm in my Paris Hilton era, (laughs) if you know what that means, and must be left alone to make bad choices while I'm young enough that it won't ruin my life. The cost of a night out is becoming so expensive that I have to forego youthful experiences to keep a roof over my head. And that is a national shame. (laughs) Moment of silence for Mary Madigan. Okay, so why did I read that article? Well, it's because she's explaining in a tongue-in-cheek way something that a lot of us are dealing with because of our current cultural climate, and that is this idea of indifference or apathy. Because what's happened is that over the last 15 years or so, we have become accustomed in the West to economic prosperity. Uh, Things have been relatively, homes have been relatively easy to buy. Things have been mostly affordable for the large part of the population. And we all thought going out of the 2010s that we were going to hit another roaring 20s. Uh, See the great crypto crash of 2019 or 2020, whenever that was. We all thought that we were all going to be rich and the 2020s were going to be great. And then reality struck in. And now we are in what many economists are calling the realistic 20s. Energy prices are up, inflation's rising, interest rates, houses are hard to buy, and there's a whole lot of geopolitical instability. And what has this caused? A wide sweeping trend of indifference across all types of people. Like, have any of you heard of the term quiet quitting? Anyone know what that is? It became popular on TikTok out of COVID where people began to realize that they could do minimal work and get away with it and still be employed. And quiet quitting basically means you do nothing beyond what is absolutely necessary. You don't show up early, you never stay late, and you never attend non-mandatory meetings. And you just kind of phone it in. You put your camera on off when you're on a Zoom meeting and just hope that nobody notices. And this, and what's, you may think, yeah, okay, well, that's probably just, you know, some people in the room. Well, statistics would say otherwise. According to a recent Gallup poll, quiet quitters make up 50% of the workforce. That means one of every two of you is a quiet quitter. And the thing is, is a lot of times, working less is a good thing. It's not always good to work harder and stress yourself out. That's not the point of this. The point is, is that there is a source of indifference or apathy in our society, and it's this. When you're told your whole life that your inputs equal your outputs, that if you work hard to achieve something and you go out and accomplish the things you set out to do, you will get the goals you wanted, and then they don't happen, 
you feel stuck. And what you do is you kind of detach and float. And many of you feel that way now. Perhaps you're not in a spot of your life you thought you would want to be financially or relationally or what your family or home ought to be like. And you begin to become indifferent, which is this, this is the idea of suppressing emotions. What indifference really means is to lack interest, concern, or sympathy. It's basically the attitude of who cares? It is what it is. And really what it is, is that that's a defense mechanism. It's this idea that things are going to change. They're not going according to my plan. So I just need to kind of just be whatever it is, what it is. I'll do what's necessary. And this is, of course, a problem in the workforce, but there is a more pressing issue where this comes to rear its head, and it's in our own spiritual lives. Because of this idea that inputs equal outputs will even bleed into our Christian beliefs, some of you feel like you've prayed to God for a while, and you were promised by some church leader to feel a certain way, to get a certain result, to have some prayer answered, and then you prayed and then nothing happened, and you're like, I guess what I do doesn't matter. Or you've pursued God fervently for a while, and it didn't really do much for you, and at the moment you don't feel like praying, feel like going to church, feel like reading your Bible, or feel like listening to me right now. And I get that. <laughs> And the question is, I won't ask anyone to raise their hands, but who all is there right now? And to be honest, I'm there right now. This is kind of where I'm at. These last couple months, it's not that all the things I mentioned aren't important or I don't seek to do them, but it's been a difficult last couple months because my emotions simply just aren't there like they normally are. I, uh, the reason for this is I recently, first of all, good news, I got engaged. Yes, clap for me. I need your validation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my fiance is here and engagement is great. Engagement is great. <laughs> However, with it comes a lot of stresses. There's stresses of planning things which I don't always love. And on top of that, there's my work life and then my friend's life and then all, all these other things, these big life changes happening. And what has happened to me is I have become so stressed and burdened by all the things happening that I've begun to just kind of suppress emotions, just kind of feel like, eh, when it comes to my spiritual life. And in God's divine sense of humor, I was told I was preaching a sermon on indifference. So, number one, it's his way of refining me and making me dig deep into why do I feel so apathetic. And so, I am walking through this process along with you, and if you feel like what you're doing is not working, you feel kind of, you just want to give up, quit, you're not feeling it right now, I'm with you. And the question I want to answer today is, what do you do when you just don't feel like trying? When you're just not feeling it, whether it be in the home, at work, or in your walk with the Lord, what do you do? And our answer will come from a very famous psalm, which is Psalm 23, which was read for us earlier. And the answer to our question is going to come right off the bat, followed by three implications, which means we have a rare treat of a four-point sermon this morning. <laughs> and here they are. Know the shepherd, follow the path, seek his presence, trust his promises. These will be the things that help us recover out of our sense of indifference. So first... Right off the bat, we have to know the shepherd. To fully defeat the feeling of not feeling anything, to fully defeat apathy, you have to understand this biblical imagery and the radical nature of it behind this old metaphor of the shepherd. Because the reason that you're, you may be struggling with feelings of indifference or detaching from certain things is one simple concept we don't talk about often. And it's our affections. In Western society, we love to talk about emotions, which are different than affections. Emotions are like, how, you, how are you feeling today? Happy, sad, excited, depressed. And we post about it on social media, whatever that is. Most of the time, happy. And what we don't talk about 
is affections, which are our deepest yearnings, deepest longings, things that are most core to us, things that drive us, the values that keep us going, because your greatest affection, the thing at the deepest core of you, whatever you're attracted to the most will determine your life's path. For those of you in the room who are married, your marriage is not determined by your emotions, but your affection. Your emotions are all over the place. Sometimes they're not there, but it's the affection of the commitment to the other person. There's something deeper at the core of you that keeps you going even when the emotions aren't there. And that's something that we need in life. And the problem is, there's usually two different solutions to when people say they just aren't feeling it. Culture will tell you, look, you need to pursue something that makes you feel happy, pick up a hobby, do something that's fun and feel happy again. And that could be a good solution, but the problem is temporary feelings will not overcome your overwhelming sense of indifference because they're temporary. What you need is something deeper, something that lasts longer than just an emotion or a feeling. You need something deep in the core of you. But on the other hand, religious culture may tell you, look, here's your problem. You need to fear God more, know he's all powerful, be afraid, know that you need to live the right way or else he's gonna get you. And we usually hear one of these two answers resounding in American circles. And the thing is, Christianity is neither. It is neither simply just feel good or do what you're told. There's something deeper to it. Christianity stirs your deepest affections in a way nothing else can. And Charles Simeon put it this way. Christianity does not encourage apathy. It does not encourage you to just unplug because now you're good to go when you're going to heaven when you die. No, it is to regulate, not to eradicate our affections. And the question is, how does it do it, and how do we see it in the psalm? And the entire essence of Christianity, this entire idea of how to have this affection is found in the first verse, Psalm 23, 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I shall not want. What David is saying is that God is a shepherd to him, his shepherd, personal. And if you understand the metaphor, there is no other response than for your affections to be stirred. Because to be a shepherd in those times would have meant intimate care for the sheep 24-7, because sheep are dumb. If you let them, they'll eat poisonous berries that will kill them. They have no natural defense mechanism from predators. So shepherds had to be with them all the time, guiding them and leading them. And he knew all the sheep by name and could recognize all of them because they're helpless and they constantly need guidance. And David has the audacity to say that God looks at an apathetic sheep like himself, apathetic sheep like us, and to say that God wants to be a shepherd, my shepherd, your shepherd. He wants to be with you, to draw near. No matter how you feel about him, no matter how indifferent you are, he is not indifferent in response He says, I want to be your shepherd. And the thing is, you may hear this all the time, but you cannot let it whiz over your head. You have to know this and know it deep. And here's how. You've got to know this to the very core of your being and let it be the thing that stirs your deepest affections. And what I'll do is I'll give you a key to reading the whole Bible if you can just understand this concept, something that will unlock many passages for you. What you see is that while every verse of the Bible has a meaning on its own, something communicated to that audience at that time, the entire Bible is a one big gigantic story with a beginning and a conclusion, and ultimately its fulfillment is found in Jesus who secures the ending. And so everything in scripture whispers his name and points to him. And you can find this in the gospels when you turn to John 10, where Jesus looks at this psalm where David says, the Lord is my shepherd. And Jesus says in John 10, I am the good shepherd. He's saying that psalm, it finds its fulfillment in me. And he's basically saying, you want to know how God is a shepherd? You want to know how God gets involved with his sheep? You want to see what it's like for God to be personally intimate with his creation? Here I am in the flesh. I have come to show you that I actually am the good shepherd, that God is that way. But he doesn't stop there. 
It's not that just that God gets intimately involved with the care and protection of sheep who don't always feel like they want to care about him. There's something deeper. He goes one step further. Look at verse 2 in Psalm 23, where it says that he, the shepherd, makes me lie down in green pastures. Now, of course, this is more sheep imagery, this more shepherding imagery, but what you have to understand, the clear whispers of Jesus in this verse are found in that Hebrew word that says, make me lie down. That word for make me lie down was used in other contexts to talk about an exhausted animal working the fields like an ox or a donkey, where the farmer or the shepherd would say, you may rest now. And here's what this psalm is saying, that not only is God intimately involved with us, personally wanting us, he actually comes as a shepherd to earth, but not just being with us, he actually dies on our behalf. The good shepherd who gives up his life for the sheep who looks at our apathy and our indifference, who looks at our wide varying emotions and says, I will give my life for you and in you I will bound up my treasure and give you my life, everything I have, down to the drops of my blood. That this is a shepherd who is unlike anything else. This is what makes Christianity different. What stirs your deepest affections the most is not finding God to be all-powerful, though that can stir your affections. It's not in God being all-knowing, though that can stir your affections. What's unique and core to the gospel and unique and core to your life is this idea that God looked at you at your darkest, at your worst, and said, your life is worth giving mine up for. To have your emotions stirred, to know the shepherd, is to find him beautiful. And that is something we are not good at in North Dallas. We're way better at coming and doing the things we're supposed to do rather than clinging on to finding him to be the most beautiful thing that could possibly be out there, which is why David can sit and say, I have the shepherd, I don't need anything else. And here's the thing, we have to find beauty in who God is as shepherd. To know him is to find him beautiful. To know that he has a heart that is triggered with love, that when he sees the sins and failures of the sheep, he comes with a heart throbbing with compassion to forgive and to heal, and to do it by giving up everything he had. That is beautiful. That is something deeper than emotions, deeper than fleeting feelings of happiness. You can't get this anywhere else for someone who looks at your deepest self, sees all of your negative thoughts against them, and then says, I will bound you up and make you my treasure. That you are my treasured possession. I give you everything. And feels nothing but overwhelming love for you and wants to shepherd you. You have to know this and know it deep. This has to go from the head to the heart. Let his beauty wash over you. And when you know him, your affections, the things deepest to you will change because they have no other choice to. And so for some of you in the room, that is the application of the sermon to simply, perhaps for the first time, find him to be beautiful in and of himself simply because of what he did. But it is an abstract concept. It is kind of hard to see that. And so... What, we have, what we're going to spend the rest of our time doing is fleshing out the implications of what it means to know him and what it looks like practically and how this can overcome feelings of indifference. So the second point we're going to look at is follow his path. That after you know, when you know him, you follow his path because what happens is when you find God to be utterly beautiful and splendid and more lovely than anything else and your affections are stirred, it leads to a transformed life which David points at in Psalm 23, 3, where he says, he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And at first you may think like, well, what good does that do? Is this, you know, checking the box at church in a religious sense? And it's not. It's all about the attitude towards it. What you have to see is the reason of why of living a holy life and what it does. And David says so in verse 3. He says, he restores my soul. 
Notice that in verse three, he restores my soul, is attached to, he leads me in paths of righteousness. And so what David is saying is to find God to be most beautiful and to then find the things that he finds beautiful to be beautiful and then to seek to do those things produces a holy life and one in which he comes more alive rather than more restrained, which is how we typically think that living for God would be like. But the thing is, if you find God beautiful, then over time, You'll find what his heart finds beautiful to be beautiful and your whole self and your deepest self will awake from its indifferent slumber. It'll overcome feelings of apathy and discover the heart of God afresh. And this is the opposite. The reason this is hard is this is the opposite of what we're told in Dallas. We are told that pursuing whatever you feel like will make you happy and then getting that thing will make you happy. When it's actually not true. And even secular psychologists have been studying this for the last 30 years or so, that if you make happiness your goal and you try to achieve it, you'll actually end up not being happy. And it's because your brain is wired, we have found out, with this thing called hedonic adaptation. It's basically this part of your brain where it keeps you from being elated or too elated for too long from positive events to keep up your motivation, but it also keeps you from being depressed for too long from bad events to keep up your motivation. The thing is, is you get used to the circumstances that, that come new to you. So if you find some new sense of happiness, you'll get used to it. And then that thing you thought would make you feel forever good only made you feel good for a little bit, and then you might feel right now like you're floating. That's what happens to a lot of us. And what David is saying is the opposite, that pursuing happiness for its sake is life draining, but pursuing God for his sake is life giving because you're attaching your deepest affections, your deepest desires, your deepest goals to something that is not fleeting, that cannot be taken away, that is not based on temporary emotions, but is based on finding the eternal God to be the most beautiful and that can't be taken away from you. And if his God's overwhelming grace and mercy become the most affection-stirring thing in your life, your wants and your emotions will change. And in the meantime, when all of a sudden God becomes the end of your life and not something that can be taken away or that is fickle or that can change, you will actually become more alive than you were before. And it could be summed up like this. Aim for holiness and you'll get happiness. Aim for happiness and you'll get neither. And that can only be true, you can only find that to be true if you truly believe that God is the most beautiful thing out there. And to do that, you've got to know the shepherd. Know him deep. And then from there, that makes you want to follow, your path, follow his path. Because he's worth it in the end. And you understand that. That's what David is saying is to get you out of feelings of indifference or out of wanting to withdraw and that might sound great in all these first two points, and you can see how perhaps that might lead to a life of passion, but you still might feel indifferent, and what if you still just don't feel like it? What happens when you know these things, but you still just don't feel like doing any of these things? Your circumstances are making you want to withdraw and detach, and that's where our last two points will come into play, and we'll start with this. If that's you, the thing you do in the middle of your circumstances is seek his presence. This will be your answer. And if you understand this, you can learn to find joy in the shepherd when life is making you feel very indifferent. And the way you can see this is in the very famous verse four that I want you to look at with fresh eyes and you'll see something different out of it this morning, hopefully. Psalm 23, four. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. I want you to notice very carefully the wording of that verse. David does not say, even though I walk through the valley of death. He says, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And that's different. That means something completely different because what he's saying is that 
what he's walking through is actually not death itself, but it's shadows and stuff that makes you afraid. We're afraid of the dark. And he's saying the shepherd is with him. And the reason this is relevant to you is because we live in an era that what keeps you indifferent oftentimes, what wants, makes you apathetic or not want to get out of bed or not do anything, is the noise rattling around in your heads. We deal with a whole lot of mental shadows today. And there's a lot of them. I want you to think about how many times you hit the pillow at night and all the rushing thoughts, racing thoughts in your head, all the things you wish you had done differently, all the things you're stressed about, all the worrying you do. And beyond that, all the binge eating you find yourself in in response to your anxiety, perhaps it's under eating, or perhaps it's even drinking to just simply get away from all the things that are stressing you out. And what ends up happening is that tasks become like these big, gigantic, scary shadows that you feel like you can't overcome. And what David is saying here is that there actually is nothing to fear. Shadows can only impede your progress if you're afraid. The only reason the darkness is scary is if you're afraid. And many of us allow shadows to own a lot of real estate in our heads. And David says the reason you don't have to fear is that the shepherd is with you. Notice that the shepherd, it says that, he, that even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, the shepherd is with him through it. God is with him in the valley of the shadow of death. And in Psalm 23, 4, he says, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. What comforts David is not the non-existence of shadows or non-existence of the valley of the shadow of death, but the fact that the shepherd is with him and that these ideas of these tools the shepherd had, the rod and the staff, were meant to remind the sheep that he's there, that though what outside looks impossible or insurmountable, the shepherd is with them and he's still guiding them even when things seem dark. And that's the way to seek his presence is what you have to do is understand that everything around you that is keeping you from wanting to do anything are shadows. The only thing holding you back is a fear and a, dis, and a detachment from the shepherd. And so you have to seek his presence. And you may be thinking, okay, that's great, Grant, but again, I don't feel like doing anything. So how am I supposed to do that when I really don't feel like it? How can I feel his presence when I'm apathetic? And the reason, and how you do that is by going from knowing it intellectually to knowing it experientially. And there was a pastor friend of Tim Keller's uh, who told a story that went like this. His, this pastor friend of his had lost his wife to some illness and he was walking through the grieving process with his son and you know they were going through life and they're walking through down the streets of the city they lived in and one day as they're walking through the streets, they were standing at the corner about to cross the street and a bus drives by and a shadow crosses over them. And as, the, as this was happening, the boy asked the father, dad, why did mom have to die? And what's the, wh why did God let that happen? And as he's, this pastor is sitting there trying to think of how to explain it, he thinks about the bus and it hits him and he gets down on his knees and he says to, to, his, to his son, what happened when the bus drove by? And he said, well, the shadow crossed over us. And the, past, and the pastor said, his dad said, exactly. Jesus took on the bus of death, the truck of death, so that we might only experience its shadow. So here's what you have to see in the midst of everything that you're going through that it feels like you want to detach, is to know that the shepherd is with you through the valley of the shadow of death and knows the, the valley of death more deeply than you do so that everything around you can only be shadows. That the key right there is to know not only that the shepherd is with you in the darkness, but he's the one who allowed it to all be shadows. And so that means that when that relationship you have sours, when you can't sort out your own thoughts, when you feel like nothing you're doing is working, we think that the more indifference we feel, the more alone we are,
but not with this good shepherd. The more isolated and alone and indifferent you feel, and the more you feel like you're in the valley of the shadow of death, the more the shepherd makes apparent that I took on that death so that all these things around you can be shadows. You have to know he's with you. And the way to experience his presence and him being with you is to praise him for it. Too often in churches, we end with the application of understanding doctrine, understanding teachings, but to experience it and to know it for certain, to let it be a part of the deepest part of you, would be to praise him for it. So when you know that what the shepherd has done to make everything around you shadows, you respond either in worship here or you go home Get on your knees and pray and thank God for being the shepherd who takes on death so that everything around us is only shadows. And the love of the shepherd, his presence with you, his willingness to do that, melts the heart and lets indifference turn into passion. Something deeper than anything else going on in your life to allow you to walk through whatever, seeing it only as shadows. Now, the thing is, a lot of you feel like nothing is ever going to change. I am stuck in this situation. My circumstances may never, ever change. And what am I supposed to do about that? And this will be our last point, to trust his promises. Because again, one of the core reasons that we feel indifferent is, that we've, is the thought that nothing will change. When we shrug our shoulders and say, it is what it is, nothing's gonna change, why bother? That's not what the shepherd is about. That's not what Christianity is about. Look at verse five. It says that you prepare for me, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Now, we've been going through the Psalms a lot in our dwell readings, you personally, and through our sermon series, and you may come across a lot of Psalms where people are talking about enemies, and you're like, you have one of two responses. Either one, I have no enemies, or two, yeah, I hate that coworker. Like, that's usually where we go. But reading this through the light of the cross is something different. When you read this psalm and the whispers of Jesus in it, what you understand is the reason God can make us joyful now is that the ultimate enemy, which is death, has been defeated and will ultimately one day be defeated for good. Because in the Bible, death is not just this literal physical thing. It does mean that. It's something broader. That there's this idea that death is all around us and it's found in the decay of creation. That all around us, things are decaying and not the way they're supposed to be. And death is around all of us. That even if you aren't close to somebody, if people close to you aren't passing away, which they may be, you're, you experience death as your own body wears down, your beauty fades. If you go down a, room, a road of substance abuse or if relationships are collapsing around you, you can feel the weight of decay going all around you. And losing all those things may make you want to give up and think nothing will ever be better. But you have to see that this psalm points to something beyond. Psalm 23, 6. I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And I don't have time to explain this this morning, but what this is referring to is that one day God will make things right. Death will ultimately one day be defeated. Its sting has already been taken away, but one day it will literally end. There will be no more decay, no more corruption. Everything on earth will be set back the way it's supposed to be. And if you know that, that that's the promise the shepherd makes, and you trust him, and you know that death will be defeated one day, then you know that not all is meaningless. Things will change. Even if it's not right now, they will ultimately one day change, and if he can change that, he can change something in your life. But your ultimate hope is what is coming in the future. If you wanna survive the hundreds of little deaths that will happen to you, lost dreams, broken relationships, the decay of your life, long stretches of unsuccessful or unsatisfying work without detaching, without thinking that nobody will ever love me so I've just gotta avoid everybody, you need hope. You need a guarantee that it's not all for nothing to avoid the trap of protecting yourself from any more hurt than you've already felt by withdrawing and feeling indifferent about it all. What you need 
is to know that all will be made well one day. And that, if you are a believer, is your eternal destiny, that there will be a day when you look and stare into the eyes of Jesus and forever death will be gone, which means all of the things that plague us now are not all for nothing. What goes on now does not mean you have to give up. You don't have to be like, nothing's ever gonna change because no one day it will change. And as the band comes up, let me close with this. We often have a defense mechanism that we think that things aren't gonna change, whatever, I'm just gonna detach, I'm sick of dealing with this, I'm gonna go about it my own way. And my friends, if you're beginning to lose hope, if it's causing you to suppress emotions so you don't get hurt, if, if you become indifferent to people so you can never be hurt again, if you feel like God isn't listening, go back and know the shepherd deeply. Know what he has done and let him stir the deepest affections of your heart. See how God lets the very darkest parts of death plunge into his own heart so that we may only experience shadows and know there is hope. There's something beyond this. That if you know the shepherd, you praise him so that your longings are changed. Find what he finds beautiful to be beautiful, to make him your goal, your end. Slowly but surely, the apathy and indifference that you face will be replaced with something deeper that can propel you on beyond and through all life circumstances, recognizing you face the valley of the shadows of death and not the valley of death because that's what the good shepherd took on. Let us pray. Father, thank you for today and for your word. Thank you that you are the good shepherd who allows us to be comforted by your presence. And furthermore, that you see us as worthy of giving your life for. And that means that everything around us is shadows. There really is joy in you. There really is hope in you. And you are the most wonderful thing that could possibly exist. Let our hearts see that. Let our hearts be stirred by that. And for my friends in the room who are hurting, who don't know what to do, who feel like they're just kind of eh about everything, know that you're with them even in that, and that in the midst of their apathy, you're not apathetic towards them. In your name I pray, amen.